Well, thank you guys so much for having us. We're super excited to be here um, from San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. Uh, I'm gonna start the presentation with some background on our outcome-based husbandry, um, working with uh, a lot of our wildlife in more environmental cues and natural behavior. Um, and then I'm gonna pass it over to some of my, my colleagues, uh, Katie and Jessica are gonna focus on some sloth experiences. So um, I'm just looking to make sure I can see people if I need to. Um, there we go. Okay, so um, again, my name is Nikki Boyd. I am the curator of Mammals, Ambassadors and Applied Behavior at the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. And I will let Katie and Jessica introduce themselves when they do their portion of it. Um, but I'm gonna start off with some of our Tomando experiences. So what I'm gonna talk about today is some of our behavioral um, workflows. I'll do a little case study on one of our um, new management strategies we use with our Tamanduas. And um, I should say Tamandua for those who are actually in country. I know we're, we're bad here in the States when we, the way we say it, I have to get criticized from, from the locals. So apologize for that. Um, but getting straight into the behavioral workflows is our new way of doing enrichment. We, we're kind of flipping the model from enriching animals to having life experiences. And so we focus on our outcomes first, and this has a heavy uh, influence from their natural behavior. So we focus on doing a lot of research on how these animals survive and live in the wild. And it's really fun to kind of really expand your mind. There's so much information available to us to us now, videos and, and lots of different um, options for you to really understand ecology of tamandua and sloth in the wild. And so what are some of those environmental cues that they might be experiencing? Even if you're not in their native habitat, how do you mimic some of those? And then what are the inputs that you can provide that elicit some of those natural behaviors? So this is an example of a Tamando workflow. We were just going through this yesterday. So I took a nice screenshot of it. And um, at the end of my presentation, I will leave up my um, email address and I can email blank ones if people are interested in trying to work through this with animals that they manage. Um, but basically we start off with the, the context or components of the behaviors. So all the behaviors you might think of a Tamandua doing, and then you look through their natural history and what do they need to, maybe you'll pick out, like you'll focus on, okay, which behavior do we wanna focus on? So digging, foraging for ants, small insects, or maybe foraging in a log. And then you look at, so those highlighted spots, you look at the, the adaptations that they have to do all those behaviors. So, and we just start throwing everything at the wall in our meetings. So they, they have a long tongue, they have sharp claws, they have a great sense of smell, they have thick skin, their fur is really coarse to protect them from the insects trying to bite them. But we know Tamandua upper arm muscles are really strong. They need to use their back muscles for climbing and hanging. Um, their elongated nose gets into those tunnels. So you just can kind of get an idea of like all these behaviors that all these adaptations, the, the functions of their body that they would use to do those things of the behavior you've picked. And then you want to think about, well, how would I know that what would be the observable things or measurable outcomes you could expect to see if they elicited those behaviors? So if they're doing these behaviors highlighted in yellow, you would see, because again, a lot of nocturnal species, you don't get to see them always doing everything, but you would see turned up dirt dirt in their nails, dirt on their nose, the food would be gone. So that's an easy one there, uh, unless it crawled away. But you want to think of all these things, the presence of sticky saliva on surfaces, items that are ripped up or turned over, a satisfied, satiated, you know, tired animal. Their feces might have some evidence in there with some dirt in there. You've got the, um, the exoskeletons of the insects, um, and they maybe, you know, in the wild, they do get bit. You'll see them kind of constantly wiping their their face off. They might have some some bites too. So then you think of the inputs. So the inputs are the last thing. And so what would you want to put in there to elicit some of these natural behaviors? So hanging root balls. We also, I should mention, work with our safari park. And um, so we've got some great uh, cross pollination, I think, with some ideas. Um, they use the hanging root ball a lot up at the safari park that looks like a, a beehive. 
Um, these are different inputs that we can put in there, a clay nest, um, leaf cutter fungus. We have an entomology department here at San Jose Wildlife Alliance that offered us some um, approved leaf cutter fungus that we could put in there. It could be a reliable cue for tomato in the future as well. Um, maybe their saliva is sticky enough that you can use it as a glue to put stuff together. Um, and so you can just see all of these options. So um, at the bottom, you'll see decomposing wood, uh, termites from the zoo, piles of rotting wood. And so we kind of focused on that a little bit for, for the case study. But I wanted to give you just another example. I know this is um, more for a small carnivore, but this one is, I thought, a, a well captured visual for, for things that you could really do. So if you were thinking of a coati, for instance, and you wanted the behavior of foraging for a bird's nest, you can see all the adaptations that the, the coati would have. You can see all the evidence of if a coati were going after a bird's nest. And then you have these fun brainstorming ideas of how to create a bird's nest that a coati could forage for in a habitat. So we know that we can't give real birds or real eggs, but you might be able to put a fake nest. You could weave together some pine needles or some other kind of fake nest. You could get molted feathers from a bird and put them around as a reliable signal. You might even have vocalizing um, protective mother sounds, depending on what birds they might hunt in their natural environment. And then you can create this whole layered experience that is a reliable signal. Maybe when they hear that mother bird chirping or they see the eggshells or the feathers, they start to explore their habitat. And that's really what our goal is, is it's this outcome-based husbandry that focuses on wild behavior. So the case study I want to talk to you about is kind of how we get to this point. We have um, different meetings around the zoo. Some of them are focused on hoofstock, some are focused on carnivores, some are focused on elephants. And the ANTS group is Armadillo, Tomando, and Sloth, which is a fun acronym. We tend to come up with these, these fun acronyms. And um, our groups are the San Diego Zoo and Safari Park doing a Zoom meeting together, working through um, the workflows. And each meeting are run by the wildlife care specialists. So those are our keepers. And we focus the fact that um, we just want to be there as, as a management team, as a curator. I want to be there to remove roadblocks. But I also sometimes will take on different homework, like I might research um, the cost of a product, um, but we we all have these different uh, homework assignments and the specialists run the meeting, they collect the information, they take minutes, they have a folder that's shared within the two teams and um, we all put in different things. We, we carry like have lots of hands lower the load, right? So it it gives everybody a little bit of responsibility without being overwhelming for one person to try to manage all this. And we're lucky we have a, a library, um, the San Jose Wildlife Alliance Library, but Google Scholar has some great scientific papers that can really help you kind of understand exactly how certain behaviors are performed by the different species. And then it's fun to watch YouTube videos and um, get in there and see what other zoos are doing as well. But really focusing on wild behavior and, and looking at their wild counterparts can allow you to have those inputs in managed care. And some other roadblocks we might remove would be like, well, the veterinarians don't want us to do this or the nutrition doesn't, doesn't we didn't get that approved through nutrition. And so as management, we kind of go back and we explain where um, we're heading with outcome-based husbandry. We've certainly got a lot of buy-in in our organization, but for those of you out there who might be trying it for the first time, that's why it's helpful for your lead supervisors, managers, or curators at some, some combination to come to some of these meetings and help remove the roadblocks so that you don't get stuck at a point and, and aren't successful. So um, I'm, again, happy to talk about any of that. It's It's been fun. Sometimes it's a financial thing, like people don't know what money they have to spend. So, or it might be coordinating volunteers to make mud mounds. So it is a really important component of being successful with outcome-based husbandry. So um, this is one of our Tamandua right after a breeding um, event. And he has a behavior you'll see in the video, uh, which we just describe as claw popping. So he snaps his claws together a little bit. He's a little excited because he just gets to breed. Um, this is one of our males from the zoo went up to the safari park for breeding. And um, so he's a little excited and a little itchy, but he does this behavior. But then you'll see at the end, 
he redirects that behavior into ripping apart this log. There it is. And I would be interested at the end if anyone else has seen that behavior. That's the only time I've ever seen do that. And through some of the research, we've watched them tear through cement-like termite mounds. And we know that they really enjoy very um, dense uh, wooded material to be able to dig through. Um, termite mounds that are, you know, encased in termite um, saliva that's very hard like cement. So they're built for, for ripping and tearing lots of stuff apart. So after the workflow, we decided we wanted to get more logs for them. So we actually went up to... Um, a former uh, director of the zoo has these like 20,000 uh, acres of land in a homestead with a bunch of other homes, but they have these rotting logs up there. So we went up with our entomology team, our horticulture team, they brought the chainsaws, and we went and collected a whole bunch of rotting logs. But I just, I'm just fascinated that, you know, people want to. You guys <laughs> This is a fire hazard for them. So the woman with me, who is the daughter, um, was like, I'm so fascinated you guys want to take all these rotting logs. But our goal was to to try to collect enough logs that we could maybe get a queen um, of, we were approved for carpenter ants or um, termites. And if we could get a queen in a big enough piece, we could keep her alive and she would keep reproducing and we could just cut off chunks of this log to give the tamanduas um, and other, we have aardvarks, we have other insectivores as well that benefited from this. And so these are just some still shots of, of um, one of our tamanduas being able to get exposure to those logs. And then I think I have another video of him, the the son of the one who had just gotten to breed. I believe this is Moni. Jenny's on here, she can confirm. Um, just really having a great time getting to rip apart and, and to you know engage with these logs for, for for a really long time too. And sometimes if they're not infested with ants or termites, then we can add wax worms or mealworms um, okay. into the space. So we're constantly, we didn't get sustainable wood at this time. So we do need to go back out there. But um, I know at the safari park, we actually had piles of logs in some areas that we used to use for our entomology department for the decomposing, um, the decomposers in the insect world to have the that rotten wood to kind of tear up and, and eat and consume. So there are ways in your own facilities, your own spaces to kind of have piles of logs that are just kind of rotting. And if, of course, go through your own approval systems through um, your nutritionists, your veterinarians, and make sure that everyone's on board. But um, it's really been a fun experience being able to, um, and we can watch that all day, but <laughs> I'm going to move on. Uh, but it's, it's really great to see the animals be able to have this natural behavior. So um, this is a paper that our um, VP of Wildlife Care, who was the welfare uh, curator at the time, and our manager of both the zoo and the safari park of welfare create, did write a paper. So um, this is the link to the paper. I'm happy to share it with anybody, but you can also see the title. And it really explains the outcome-based husbandry, um, the enriched experiences, and kind of um, gives you a little more detail. And the, you know, the peer-reviewed uh, paper process uh, certainly validates that. So that's kind of how we get to the outcome-based husbandry. And this is my contact if anyone wants to reach out, but I'm going to stop sharing and I'm gonna hand it over to Katie and Jessica. And they're going to talk about some of the sloth enriched experiences that they've been able to do at Wega Fourth Bowl. Hi. I'm Katie. I'm the lead at uh, Way of Fourth Bull, which is a wildlife presentation area. And we are doing our technical stuff right now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And then I did you already I did. did. You okay, cool. Awesome. <laughs> No, I didn't. Oh, you didn't introduce me. Okay, cool. Sorry, I was focused on sharing. Um, uh, my name is Jessica, and I am a senior wildlife care specialist at the San Diego Zoo, and more specifically, um, one of our wildlife faster areas, Wagga Fort Bowl. Um, it's 
a big amphitheater area, which we've got some videos of, you can see some of that amphitheater area. And then all of our wildlife ambassadors are behind the scenes. Um, but more specifically, we wanted to focus on uh, Tornero here as part of our sloth enriched experiences. So, did that go? <laughs> we got this, guys. It's gonna, it's gonna move. It's working. There it is. Okay, good. Um, so first, we wanted to give you a little. Uh, history of Tornero. Tornero is the cute little little guy in the middle. Um, he was born right here at the San Diego Zoo in 2019. Um, and one of his mother is actually a wildlife ambassador in our sister ambassador area. Um, her name is Zena. I think Zena is this one. Yeah. And then Brad Pitt was actually from another facility. So he wasn't necessarily a wildlife ambassador. Um, but since Zena, his mom was a wildlife ambassador as well, we had the amazing opportunities to start interacting with Tornero at a very young age. Um, so he was mother weird, but since she was very comfortable with her wildlife care specialist, we were able to start interacting with her and use in positive reinforcement. And I kind of like to say that we were kind of like free babysitters uh, for some of the, the beginning parts. Like if she went off to do a presentation or things like, like that, um, that we could step in and start having these positive interactions with Tornero, or we would be there when both of them were together. Um, and then eventually uh, when it was time for him to leave the nest, uh, he came to Wego Forks Bowl and he is... Yeah, so I guess he'll be five in April. Oh my goodness, where does the time go? Um, so here are some of the ways that we actually get to just do regular enrichment on a day-to-day -day, um, for Tornero and his habitat. So we've got really unique, um, they're not unique. I mean, they're cool little kebabs um, that we can hang his food on, or we've got little hanging feeders right there. Um, we also have have different water sources uh, for him. We also have a mister system set up for him. Um, and then we also will add different types of substrates in his habitat. Um, but we also have um, a bunch of approved plant species for him. Um, so we have honestly probably like what, 40 to 40 yeah. to 50 potted trees and different plant types um, for him that we can actually add into his habitat. And you'll see that later on. Um, and then we've also will do different types of scents in his habitat too. And then um, here are a couple ways that we actually get to enrich him outside of his habitat. Um, so we call these exploratory climbs. He's got like probably currently like 10 different locations where we can take him around. Um, I know you can see that he's on one of our railings on one of our stairways. I know it's not the most um, natural like thing, but it allows him uh, to reach over to some trees and, and have some exploring time. Because if you walk him here, he uh, you'll see his wheels turning, whether he can support himself on this, little this little thing. thing. So we can just watch it. He always thinks he can make it. It's like, no, the thicker ones, he can't. But it gets his brain going. Um, and then this video is actually shows that front of our amphitheater that I was talking about. Um, so we do a two o'clock wildlife presentation for our guests um, around the zoo. And um, we actually have a really cool like vine jungle, I call it his jungle gym system um, that's connected all throughout our amphitheater on our stage area that he can climb about. Um, this is another railing area. Um, you can see that it's kind of like a vertical climb, which you know is great uh, for his muscles as well. Um, and then here's a photo of one of his presentation perches that we can actually bring to different uh, presentation areas around the zoo if we do a night event or a, a day event for private guests, um, we can bring that too. But we also actually have vine systems at a lot of our 
uh, presentation areas as well that he can explore. And with the presentation searches and the vine, sometimes there's another sloth oh, yeah. uh, that will go on it, his mom. <laughs> and um, we notice that there's different behaviors when she's been on it previously. So that's, that's sort of something uh, cool as well. So he gets to smell different sloths. A sloth. A sloth. Um, so before we get into our specific enriched experience, there are definitely some key trained behaviors that are very important um, and that allowed us to do some of these really awesome experiences that we do with him, just so, you know, it's safe for us, it's safe for him and all positive. So he is trained to go into a travel carrier, um, also vehicle travel as well, once he's in his travel carrier. Um, we do, uh, we do have the pos or the ability to handle him. Um, he just kind of sits on the front of us. Like we're like a moving tree, as I like to say. Um, and so he's very comfortable with us holding him, but he is uh, trained to, if we tap on his feet, that means to release himself. Um, and then we also uh, have a sound machine signal for him. That's got a rainfall noise to it. Um, that has definitely been a condition thing. Uh, we live, he actually lives next to a beaver. That's one of our wildlife ambassadors. And we noticed that anytime her, her beaver pool was filling, he started being more active. So we started just capturing that movement. And then we got this amazing uh, sound machine. So that allows us to uh, use that um, for his training as well. So Katie, we don't stop there. So Nikki had showed you uh, that paperwork of um, the, this is like something that's a little more simplified that we use every day with our staff. And um, it just kind of is an abbreviated version so that somebody can look at it, be like, I want to do this, this event or experience today. What are the things I need? What do I do on each day? So we have a book of this, but we also have it in our um, computer too, so that everybody can can look at it. And even somebody from another area could look into it and see what we have, because sometimes you'll have a experience for a sloth, but it also works for, for some other things. So it's pretty simplified, this this um, experience. And so the one that we're going to show you is called loss of resources or lore. You know, you got to shorten everything up. Um, and if basically he's going to have a loss of resources and then move to a more abundant area. And we can go over it uh, on a day to day. So day one picture here is kind of what his habitat can look like on any given day. Those are those potted plants that we were talking about. We move them in and out because he he does tend to like the smaller, leafy, the younger, younger greens like we like younger kale and spinach too. You know, I don't know. It's just what he likes. And he also um, has flowers that don't eat. So there's three different kinds that we have in there. It's hibiscus, gruya, and uh, Cape Honeysuckle. He only eats the Gruya and the Hibiscus, um, but we have all those plants approved through our nutritionists to feed them as well as have them in his habitat. So day two was building the stream. We had not built the stream in his habitat yet. So um, it is a concrete bottom, but we add dirt on top. Um, so it didn't really take that much. It's a, it's a pretty shallow stream, um, but that was a new addition. Um, and with each day, especially on day two, we took out a good number of his trees as well. We just kept lessening them and lessening them. And we also took out um, some percentage of his diet, which consists of different types of veggies and greens. Um, and then with nutritionists, approval, we are taking what we cut out and we're going to save them for his last day for his abundance. So let's pause that guy. So day three, you can see that I, I think I left one tree in there just in case. Um, and then we also took out a water source as well. So all of his resources um, we're going away. And then this is day four where we actually started. Um, we wanted to have kind of like a flooding rainfall event because sloths, well, they can have ability to swim. And so 
Um, sometimes they'll use river sources to move. And we added, um, you can see the sound machine in the back and that box there is a temperature controlled um, and humidity controlled uh, area for him to live in because it does get cold here in San Diego, <laughs> believe it or not. People might not believe us. <laughs> so, so now this is the flooding experience. Um, the big, the big event. So we just had a hose and he, he chose to, to come out. So then obviously when I don't have ventured into the swimming part of his abilities yet, maybe one day in the future. Um, so we just somewhat pretended like he went into the Go move on. Um, and by that, that means that he went into his travel carrier uh, right here in that top left picture. He's in his uh, travel carrier. And then we took him to this area um, that we call Camp Timbuktu. It is a private, uh, not it's not, pub, it's not open to the public. Um, it is a secure area that we can take a good chunk of our wildlife ambassadors over there. Um, so we thought that we would take Tornero over there because there's some really cool hibiscus trees over there. So we brought one of his vines um, that he had, he's very accustomed to, and we attached it to two of the hibiscus trees. Um, so some of these videos, this one on the bottom left is kind of like the first one, uh, first time he went on it. He wasn't sure. And so he went the other direction. Um, and then the other ones are when he's getting a little bit more comfortable. Yeah, this one has this slip. I need to move. Let me see. Do that. Yeah. There we go. Um, can show him when he slips. So, so this, <laughs> so this, you know, is the thought is that he's moving to a more abundant area and, um, we were there with some reinforcement, but he he slipped, but it would happen out there in his native habitat. So he was okay. Yeah. So we ventured back and forth to the two different trees for say we were probably there for like 30 minutes or so. And then we had an amazing team on the other side back in our area that went absolutely crazy with getting his habitat with every single possible <laughs> approved trees and um, they cut some fresh browse items for him too so you can see it is a very lush environment uh, we clogged up the, the little river um, so he's got a nice little river stream in the middle um, this picture on the top right we actually put trees on the outside of his habitat too that aren't necessarily approved for him but he can't reach but we just wanted to give that that really that uh, abundance uh, look to it. Um, and they have uh, his food yes. everywhere as well. Food so. everywhere. And then this was him coming in for the first time. He was a little stunned. He was like, wait a second, where am I? But wasn't nervous or anything like that. And then, um, these bottom two photos, if you can find the sloth, um, he is in he is in there, um, hanging out in the sun, uh, super content. This was probably I don't know, like forty five minutes after we brought him home. Um, so this was during the day. Yeah, this was during the day. So um, and so we put a um camera on at night because we weren't sure. Is he going to explore at night? You know, we we just wanted to see all the movement. Now these are really short um, bit like camera uh, clips, but you can see he is using his whole habitat and moving around. And he even at one point looked like he was checking out the stream on the mm -hmm. ground. There was evidence that his he did check out the dirt and things because there was dirt on his nose in the morning when we came in. And that was from about, there was a couple that were like six to eight o'clock at night. Yeah. And then one was really like early morning. Two in the like morning. Two in the morning.
So obviously this got our brains going um, on what we want to do for future enrich experiences. Uh, we, we, since we are in our wildlife ambassador area, we have 14 parrots that are around him. I'm not sure if you could hear some of their squawking in some of the videos. Um, so we want to somehow incorporate macaws into like a multi-species um, experience with him. Um, we do have the ability to move him to a habitat that's right directly right next to them or to him. So um, that's a possibility. And um, then, of course, swimming maybe one day. Uh, if you saw in that little video in our amphitheater, we have a really cool moat um, kind of water source that's built into our stage area. It's about six or seven feet deep. We do have steps built into it, um, but maybe one day he could have a somewhat of a, a swimming experience. Um, and then one of our other care specialists that we work with, uh, she did a kind of traveling into another sloth's territory um, experience with him using um, actually Zena, his mom's uh, poop that she gathered and did a whole, what, three day experience with that. Yeah, we froze the poop just in case. Um, I know that there was poop one day, then there was evidence of a sloth and then she, used um, a stuffed sloth and um, I'm not sure if he liked it because we found the stuffed sloth on the floor the next day so <laughs> that was some of some of that and then of course we have to end on this adorable oh is it going to be we can hear the macaws yeah it's an adorable him yawning video with his long tongue but of course it's a little slow on our end but yeah, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. My name is Penny Coogan, and I'm the education coordinator for the Xenarthrin Specialist Group for the International Union of Conservation of Nature. And we are on line. We have a website, xenarthrins.org. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And if you missed this live webinar, or if you want to play it back, you can go to our YouTube channel and watch all of our past webinars for the past, I think, at least a year, maybe a year and a half. If you go to our website, zenarthrins.org, you'll see lots of different tabs. In the beginning, there's um, a species link that tells you about armadillos, every species of armadillo, sloths, and anteaters. There's about 40 of them in total. And this is really for adults and scientists. And if you're a zookeeper, this would be a great place to go. It talks about their habitat and ecology and their diet and their range. And these are all great natural uh, facts that you should know. But recently, we have added a kids section. If you go to our YouTube page or our website, you will see that we have four animated videos, one on each of the uh, extant xenarthrins, and then we also have one on extinct and the future of xenarthrins. We, and these videos are available in Spanish, Portuguese, and English. We encourage you to utilize them in your programming or share them with uh, your visitors who want to learn more. With the videos, we have coloring pages and word searches and spot the differences um, that are all available for free for you to download. And just like the videos, they are also available in Portuguese, Spanish, and English. All right, this is very important. I would like all 60 of you to take a screenshot of this for 2024 coming up you have plenty of time to plan international armadillo day is always august 13th so if you're going to do a special day to celebrate armadillos it is august 13th the official international sloth day is the third saturday of october so what that means is that the date changes every year. Last year, it was October 21st, but this year, 2024, it is October 19th. And World Anteater Day changed a few years ago. It is now always on November 19th. And if you have tomandos in your collection, you should be celebrating World Anteater Day at your facility. All right, coming up, we have three webinars. 
we usually like to do one webinar a month and that's our plan for this year. But as of now, we have three uh, scheduled. We have in March, we have how to optimize your resources to help Xenarthran conservation. In April, we have a Glyptodon uh, ancient armadillo presentation. And then later in April, we have a presentation by a Tasmanian professor about echidnas and how they are very similar to Xenarthrans. If you work at a facility or if you see Xenarthrans out in the wild and you would like to share your photos with us, you can message me on social media or you can send us an email at contact at xenarthrans.org. Now, let's say you love Xenarthrans, and I know you do because you're here. You can go to our website, which is available in three languages, and you can go to the top and click that support button, and you can donate equipment. You can donate money for us to help other uh, Xenarthran researchers, and uh, the possibilities are endless. But let's say you just don't want to donate outright. You can go to our international store at Spring, and you can buy really cool merchandise, just like the hoodie I am wearing with a representative of all of the anteaters. We have silky anteaters, we have giant anteaters, we have extinct sloths, extinct uh, armadillos. We have uh, different species of all of these. We have the main sloth, we have the giant armadillo. Um, a couple of months ago, people requested that we made a three-banded armadillo merchandise and we listened and then we had a tamandua webinar and people wanted tamandua merchandise and we listened and we made that as well and all of the proceeds of that goes to our specialist group which is uh, for education and conservation of xenarthrans and our webinars and our educational programming is sponsored by FIA the foundation for international aid to animals and nurtured by nature thank them for their continued support. All right, Nikki, you might have a few questions. Yeah, see if uh, Katie and Jessica want to join us. And um, there's a couple of wildlife care specialists on here. I don't know if you can unmute them for me if I tell you their names that might be able to help answer Marielle's question as well. Sure. But we'll let JD... Katie and Jessica answer if you guys have tried anything. And then if Jenny Izu can be unmuted, if she's willing to speak to it, or I think Jen Hardell might be on here too. I think it just says Jen H. Oh, is there any enrichment activities that you tried and did not work out at all? You know, this was doing this one was the first one that we actually filmed at night and put a camera on so we were just talking about we should have filmed that night when there was no resources in there kind of to see um i'm trying to think i mean i can't think of anything offhand yeah. <laughs> how about you jenny anything uh, to mandua yeah, yeah, I would say the, the rotting log experience itself was uh, a learning experience. Um, I think when we first offered it, uh, it did have termites in it, but they were really deep down inside. And these are somewhat spoiled zoo animals. <laughs> and we found that uh, our first commando was like willing to go over and investigate it briefly, but he didn't completely destroy it on that first night and I don't think that he got to the termites but then once we put it started putting some of his like worms and food items in like on top of the grooves of the log then he learned oh this could be a food source and we saw a little bit more interest after that um and and then other tomatoes at other times will destroy the log on the first night but not go back to it for a second night so there's been some variation in the level of interest and how hard, hard they're willing to work for their food um yeah and then I, I did other... go ahead yeah I was like I did just think of something something that that Tornero does not like is when we were doing the sound machine there was sound with thunder and lightning and that was too much that was too much he he started popping up like swinging and so we 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 through trial and error, I guess, learned that we don't want to do do that one. So maybe the thunder and lightning was a little too much. 
although we have had some big storms here in San Diego recently, and he he does okay, yeah. but we didn't need to add to it. I know we were curious about, um, since this is our first one doing this exact one, how it, maybe he will might be even more active um, if it's during like the more of the summertime and the warmer climates or springtime when things are blooming a little bit more or something like that. So I'm, I'm just curious seasonal wise when it's not uh, January, uh, when it is cold here in San Diego. So just curious about that. All right. And remember, if you have questions, you can type them into the chat box. Stacy would like to know, how often do you offer this enrichment experience? Well, this one was our first one for the loss of resource. Um, I'd say that we probably do a three or four day one with him. I don't know, like probably once a month. Once a month, twice a month. Um, they don't always have to be four days, I yeah. guess. So we do like shortened ones, abbreviated ones. Um, it This one specifically takes a lot of staff because you have to have three people to go with him and then at least two people, if not more, to put all that stuff in. So we'll do abbreviated versions of it, but yeah, once or twice a month. Mm -hmm. And then the exploratory stuff we, we do quite often. All right. Sally would like to know, you mentioned a stuffed sloth, stuffed <laughs> animal sloth in the enclosure. Uh, can you talk about how you felt safe that the animal wasn't going to eat the stuffing or the material? Um, when we had uh, taken those short, uh, you know, babysitting uh, times with Tornero, we actually used a stuffed sloth that he would sit on at first when his mom would go do the presentations. So um, when he moved permanently, we did have that stuffed sloth with him in his habitat. Um, and we had known that he wasn't ripping it up or tearing it up with, with watching him through all that time. So we knew at least from all that experience prior that he probably wasn't gonna do anything to that sloth. All right. Eliza would like to know, could you describe soil enrichment for sloths? Yeah, I mean, Nikki, yeah. <laughs> what, one of the things, there's a lot of discussions about sloth nutrition. And so um, we have three different areas with sloth at the zoo and um, some are inside and some are outside. And so we obviously have like, dirt that is in some of the habitats that's just regular soil from san diego and then we've used lomax jenny correct me if i'm wrong but i think up in base camp you guys have lomax in the indoor space and then you saw like the variety of soil both kind of dirt in with tornero and then we have the potting soil that's in the plants we do we are very careful on what we put in we have a, a quarantine protocol with our plants as they come in uh, we're careful about what soil we bring in. So I just, I want to encourage people to to follow your own institutional guidelines, but um, but it is something that's a component that's important for them, but you want to make sure if you do have a nutritionist or you can get with the nutritionist advisory group um, on what you should or shouldn't be putting in there. But if you guys have anything to add to that, you know. No, that was. They do eat soil in the wild. And so it is something that's part of, it helps with the, you know, digestive process. And um, so I think sloth nutrition is is kind of um, something that is, I think it should definitely, we, we're trying to do as much science-based research behind it that we can, um, but I think it's really important. I've seen, we've participated in quite a few research projects with uh, collecting fecal samples and sending our diet samples in. Um, you know, you can have a calcium issue too. So you want to watch the input intake of calcium and, and not feed things like spinach, um, broccoli, I think is the two, was it broccoli or what was the, the. No, um, it was, we were feeding, uh, primate pellets. Biscuits, so yeah. Spinach was another one that we were feeding more. Okay. So we had, we had to dial that back down and incorporate other greens in there too, just to make sure there wasn't too much of a certain breed. Yeah. And thanks Jenny for adding into the, the comments. Yeah, the Lomax is more like a just kind of really fluffy, like um, 
pot, like a potting soil in a way. Like it's, yeah. it's really light and airy. It's really great for growing grass and things. And we do get things like we have um, some hydroponic grass um, systems here at the zoo that we grow different um, like pallets of grass and we share them around the zoo to different um, herbivores, even put it in with carnivores and let them tear them up and dig through them. But um, it's a barley grass. So uh, we are we are focusing a lot more on giving them live plants to eat. So as you saw with Tornero, he's got a lot. I think if the the sloth is older and it hasn't had a lot of live plants, sometimes you may or may not, that might be one of the things you don't see them exploring or eating as much, but the ones that grow up with it, I think they, they get on board pretty quickly and they're, that's just part of their nutrition and their diet. All For right. the um, safari park sloth, uh, she does, is known to consume the dirt that's given in her, in one of her habitats, but does not consume the Lomax that's in the other habitat. Has there, uh, Taylor would like to know, has there been a scent enrichment that's like really successful? And if so, how, how would you be measuring success for scents? I feel like the most successful one has been uh, ones from other sloths on the, on the perches that he's been on or from the fecals that we've done. And um, we noticed that he gets kind of excited with smelling especially because they're another it's a female that he's smelling even though it's his mom or he actually does have a um another sibling now uh, she's a female um he does get excited uh, and they mark and yeah and he'll mark and rub yeah. but um excited is my pg term of what we've seen him <laughs> as, he's, as he's become more sexually mature yeah we notice the change but nothing like it never goes into like aggression or anything like that. He's he just gets very into it. Yeah. So we like that. Um, I know that we've tried like other scents and but not too too much into exploring just regular scents. So we'll have yeah, to so dive into that. Kind of say it's all been, like the the plants and the flowers are they have yeah. different scents. Um, like more like stuff like that. Mm -hmm. but. Yesterday, um, Base Camp did one of the workflows, and Jenny's the one who takes all the notes for the ants meetings. So mm -hmm. there's a question about um, enrichment examples for armadillos. Did you want to take that one, Jenny? Sure, yeah. Um, we've just kind of started to delve into creating these for the armadillos, and uh, we decided we wanted to look we saw in the photos on iNaturalist and on YouTube that a lot of times these short little three-banded armadillos were pushing their way through all kinds of bushes and tall grass area the grasses were way taller than they were and so we wanted to challenge our armadillos to also push through uh things that were bigger than them uh and through you know habitats like that and so uh when we got to the um the inputs column we talked about maybe getting like a tumbleweed or uh, taking, you know, these potted plants that we give the sloths at some point they die. We're not great plant keepers as much as we're animal keepers. <laughs> and these, we have a dead bush in a pot. We could unpot it and just put that whole thing in the armadillo habitat and put their food on the other side of it from where they are. So they have to either dig through the soil or push through kind of the twiggy parts of it. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been fun to kind of brainstorm these different things. I think these experiences have really challenged us to do that. Um, we started, it was raining here in San Diego. Some of you might have seen on the news. We've had a lot of rain this last week. Um, so we started a three-day experience for our armadillos, uh, just using that natural rain that they were already hearing. They're in an indoor space, but there's skylights. So they've been hearing rain for a few days now. Uh, so we decided that would be day one or, you know, the neutral would be the rain sounds. And then day two, yesterday, we sprayed water all over their habitat. So when they wake up and come out of bed at night, it's going to be like all wet outside. Um, and then on day three, we would offer more than the usual amount of worms, maybe take two days worth of worms and offer it on one day as if the insects are coming out after the rain has passed. Um, so just kind of working with the weather we've got too has been kind of a fun idea. And a couple of months ago, we did an entire webinar on three banded armadillos and their breeding and their care and enrichment. So you can go over to our YouTube channel to view more of that. And we also have an entire webinar dedicated to tamanduas as ambassador animals as well. All right. I think I had one more question. 
Amanda would like to know more about how you take the sloth out for exploration during the day since they're nocturnal. How do you minimize stress? How did you, you know, acclimate them to being yeah. handled or how did so you train we, them? Yeah. So our policy is if he doesn't want to come out, he doesn't have to come out even for presentations and things like that. Um, we did pair that sound uh, machine with him coming out, but it's not hundred percent. We use it as a cue to see if he wants to come out. If he comes out, then we talked about how we can handle him and move him to other places. So it's kind of his choice if, if he wants to. And if there there are sometimes a, a few days where he just sleeps in his uh, temperature control box and that is quite okay with us. He has no requirements to do presentations or even come out on those exploratory ones if he doesn't. I will say that I think uh, primarily we'll use this sound machine cue for more of like a presentation or um, a private tour event just to be like, hey, do you want to participate? Like that's us asking. The times for the explore the exploration climbs, honestly, we're walking in there to, to clean his habitat. And he starts coming out at first. We're like, hey, are you hungry? Do you want a, a, like a breakfast or something like that? And he literally will just drop his bottom <laughs> feet on and wait. Like we've attempted food with him. And he's like, no, I just want to climb on you. And he's we make sure that he's calm. He's not puffed up or anything like that. Um, so then he lashes onto us. And then literally as we're walking by some of his areas that he knows he can explore on, he literally leans toward them. Um, and then he gets right on them and just keeps going. And um, and the whole time we're watching his behavior and he never gets, for the most part, I'm not gonna say never say never, like what if there is a lightning thunderstorm? I don't know, that hits us instantly. Um, but he's usually just calm. And those are some of the times where he's eaten some clay that are alongside um, our hillsides too, as well, just venturing into the dirt too. So um, yeah. And they can last, he'll go out there. Sometimes he falls asleep. Yeah. So that's okay too. Um, but up to an hour and a half, he'll go. And that's usually when he takes a nap. That yeah. might be like 30 minutes and then he wakes up and he kind of goes. So he kind of dictates mm -hmm. what, what he wants to do. <laughs> yeah. Jessica, maybe could you talk a little bit about what it looks like when the sloth doesn't want to participate for, because we have so many zoos and aquariums <laughs> attending right now, and it might be yeah. hard to visualize a sleepy <laughs> sloth yeah, so and you, not agree. You'll see, you saw his den area that's temperature and humidified controlled. He usually doesn't come out of that as the first sign. Um, if he is already out and he may seem a little up as we'll call it, he's usually a little bit more puffed. Um, let's say he put his leg warmers on, he'll get all a little puffy. And so we won't go into the habitat if, he's showing those type of behaviors because um as you know we want it to be successful for us but also for him so um we always wait for him to be in a in a calmer behavior but usually 99 percent of the time if he doesn't want to interact with us he's sitting in his box and we'll try like hey buddy and he just literally falls asleep or he doesn't move and that's fine um we give it the good old college try and then we we go so all right and I think that's where your management team can support you. Like, you know, yeah. have a backup animal. If people feel pressure to bring a sloth out, like maybe you don't announce it's going to be a sloth. You do like an ambassador will be coming out and you kind of give yourself that flexibility so that you don't feel like you have to really, you know, force an animal to wake up, to come out. Um, so I'd highly mm -hmm. recommend, you know, working with that. You know, we're all about giving choice and, and control over participation. Um and if you are AZ accredited, you know, that is going to be a factor for, for accreditation and, and ambassadors really deserve that, that care and that recognition and that consideration. I know I've been doing ambassador work for 32 years, so I understand the pressures of it, but I think if you can work with your management teams, or if you're having any, any challenges with that, like really explain, um, you know, different goals. Uh, I think, I think most institutions are coming along with that. I've seen mm -hmm. so many, I'm on the animal ambassador SAG for AZA. And I, I see a lot of people talking about animals having choice and control to participate or not. And so um, 
happy to, to talk through that with anybody that might be having challenges, maybe from your executive team or somebody that's outside of wildlife care and give you some, some strategies to, to manage that. All right. Yeah. So we like the management team is very yeah. Good. Yeah, we've worked <laughs> with our education department as well. Um, especially when like they're booking, maybe they there is a sloth request. They know not to uh, they know to never guarantee an animal. And that's with our cheetahs and our wolves and also our sloths, but also our parrots. Um so luckily we do have a, an area where we've got a variety and hopefully one animal out of the 30 something that we interact with on a daily basis want to participate. And so um, usually people, guests are happy that something is wanting to participate at the end of the day. So. So we like to have a Zenarthron webinar once a month. If you work at a facility and are interested in presenting, you can always contact me or Mariella and Nikki. I, you know, we asked you like a few months ago and I always ask the presenters for a photo, a title, and a description. And when you sent me the photo, it was just a picture of the sloth because you said you didn't want to support or you wanted to support like the stop, the selfie campaign, and maybe, you know, advertising that these animals could be pets. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because we yes. have mentioned it in other webinars and it was so nice that you said it without any prompting. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, we all are trying to help sloth conservation, right? That's part of the goal of being able to connect people with wildlife. And one of the biggest challenges for sloths is in their home native ranges that they're being taken out of the wild for, you know, tourism photos. And so at zoos, even though we might be trained professionals and these are born in managed care, we might be inadvertently encouraging people to want to take pictures with sloths. And so I think if we all really want to be sloth conservationists, we have to be mindful of what we post because now everyone's connected internationally. It's a global, you know, web. So um, that's one great way you can support conservation. And if you do have to bring a sloth out to get them onto the tree, what I do is I use a message. I ask my teams to use the message that you can help me to support sloth conservation by not taking a picture until the sloth's on the tree. And then you can take all the pictures you want. And it kind of gets their mindset to where they're supporting conservation by not posting us holding a sloth. And we certainly don't hand them off to people either. But if you talk to sloth conservationists in the field, they will tell you they love the zoo support. So it's hard for them to tell us, please don't do this, but they don't love how close we are always showing people like with sloths because that's one of their biggest battles in their home ranges. Uh, Mariella, would you like to add anything before we sign off? Um, no, I, I fully support that last part, of course. And I really love that talk. I think it's so important to, to talk about uh, enrichment. And I mean, we see it, we had about 58 participants today. There must be a record. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I would love to continue having webinars about uh, ex situ conservation, about how to adequately keep them under human care. So uh, please volunteer for that. Yes. And thank you, Katie, Jessica, and Nikki. And then at Thanks the very end, Jenny. <laughs> yes, thank you, Jenny, for chiming yeah. in. Thank it. you, San Diego Zoo. And thank you. Thank you.